All right, everyone, welcome. Thank you for sticking around and come to chat with us about what's possible in WordPress 5.0. So with this session, we're hoping to show you a little bit about uh, what WordPress is doing. And, you know, sometimes we go heads down, we're in the Drupal world, um, and it's nice to look around and see what's going on in other spaces and just have an idea. So we're talking about some of the upcoming changes in WordPress. My name's Andrew Taylor. I'm a developer programs engineer at Pantheon. I actually come from more of the WordPress side. I came to Pantheon about two and a half years ago uh, when Pantheon does Drupal and WordPress uh, as a platform. So came on to kind of provide some WordPress expertise, but I've really kind of grown into uh, the Drupal space as well. And there's things like configuration management I wish WordPress had. And so we're gonna look at some of those um, pros and cons. And with me, I have Steve Persh. Hello. Steve Persh here, lead developer advocate at Pantheon. You can find me as Steve Vector pretty much all over the internet, Drupal.org, uh, GitHub, Twitter. Uh, you might remember me from some past core conversations like, I just want to edit a node at DrupalCon Denver, or what panels can teach us about web components in 2015. You might also remember Andrew and I co-presenting at DrupalCon New Orleans. We gave a WordPress-focused focus session in the Horizons track called Lessons from WordPress Core. That was more focused on uh, the processes by which uh, WordPress Core does its core development. And one of the main points we, we had in that presentation was the idea of WordPress as a twin island for Drupal. We've been hearing about getting off the island in Drupal for a number of years. At the Dries note uh, this week, we heard about, let's, let's just take Drupal to the, the PHP mainland. I, I think that sounds like a, a great idea. We've got bridges and ways of, of getting to the wider PHP community. But there, there is another island out there, and it's, it's WordPress. It's a pretty similar island to ours, and we think uh, we benefit by, by having good communication, good learnings from that island. Many of the fundamentals on WordPress island are very similar to Drupal Island. GPL, LAMP stack, CMS started in the early 2000s, led by uh, the benevolent dictator for life, uh, who also is, is the lead of, of the major uh, company in the ecosystem. Uh, Dries with, uh, with Acquia, Matt Mullenweg with Automatic. They also distribute power through you know, a system of, of lieutenants leading the process of core development. There's patch-based collaboration on pre-GitHub sites, WordPress.org, Drupal.org. They serve similar client bases, higher ed, media, uh, small businesses. Both CMSs can now uh, claim whitehouse.gov at some point in time as well. Um, Back in 2016, when we did that presentation at DrupalCon New Orleans, we were uh, basically giving a, a, plus to, a plus one to developments that were happening in core development process on the Drupal side, like a regular release schedule. We were pointing to how those had been successful in WordPress. WordPress in 2016 was on a four-month release cycle where there were different rotating release leads, basically a, a more formalized way of distributing power amongst um, some of the top developers in WordPress and they were working on multiple features at once, keeping things backwards compatible. Uh, over the last two years, Drupal and WordPress kind of uh, started moving in, in opposite directions on these specific questions. Drupal, uh, back in 2016, had just adopted the every six month cycle. It was starting to go well. Two years later, it's going, I think, really well. Uh, WordPress is now in a mentality of the next major release, 5.0, will be released when it's ready not uh, on a four-month cycle. When it's ready, I think sounds familiar to, to a Drupal audience, uh, remembering to the, uh, the way Drupal 8 worked. Um, also, uh, power has gotten a little more concentrated on, on the WordPress side with one of the main features coming in in WordPress 5.0. Matt Mullenweg decided he needed to take uh, more direct control over the way core development process was working. And because he wanted to make 5.0 a more focused release, it meant some areas of core that some sections of the community were interested in just haven't gotten much attention because they were not designated as the focus for 5.0. Democratizing publishing is the big idea in the WordPress community. That's one, one idea I really want to communicate, that WordPress, since its founding, has been focused on the idea of democratizing publishing. And basically what that means is making the tools of publishing as accessible as possible to as wide of an audience as possible. And I think that's one of the, the main ways of separating out um, why these 
two islands with very similar fundamentals sometimes have different priorities because I think um, WordPress is able to more clearly articulate their end goals. So Gutenberg, this is the WYSIWYG editor that we'll be spending much of our time talking about uh, coming in WordPress 5.0. The goal here is not just to create a seamless post and page building experience, but also to provide a seamless writing experience. WordPress, much more so than Drupal, is very focused on that end user experience, uh, that persona of who actually is going to be using these sites and their day-to-day -day job is much more represented uh, in, the, in the WordPress community than it is in Drupal. Drupal's focus, I don't think is sharp as democratizing publishing. You know, right now, I think ambitious digital experiences is probably the clearest phrase we have that captures what we're trying to do as a community. Before that, we had come for the code, stay for the community, or community publishing. Someone reminded me of that one last night. Uh, at the first Dries note I ever saw in 2010, Dries ended with a message of, let's keep our culture of innovation execution and fun that we had as of 2010. If we keep that culture, then awesome happens. And I think all of these are, are generally positive and I, I don't, um, don't have anything against any of these messages, but they're not as focused as let's democratize publishing. Dries also in 2010 recognized that there was two paths before Drupal. We could move up market, as he described it. We could develop more enterprise-friendly features like configuration management, like content staging, uh, and that would help us win larger and larger projects uh, for more and more money uh, per project. Or we could go after a wider group of people, uh, try and capture a larger share of the internet by serving the needs of of uh, basically the mass market, um, what Treats at the time described uh, as the approach WordPress was taking, and I think the, the approach WordPress has been very successful with to date. Um, I was also just happy to hear, listening back to what Treats was saying eight years ago and realizing my perceptions were, were accurate. I had been, as I'd been preparing for this, I wanted to say Drupal as a community is more driven by developers and what developers think is, is cool technologically. And it was nice to just watch the Dries note in 2010 and hear him say that explicitly. Like, it wasn't my imagination, it wasn't subtext, it was actually what Dries was saying in 2010, that Drupal is driven by the interests of developers. He hoped, though, he hoped that in 2010, the concept of distributions would allow us to uh, better address the needs of the mass market. And to some degree, that has been successful, but um, just on the level of do we have the market share or not, no. Um, no, we don't. Distributions didn't really um, meet that need in the way we were, we were hoping. Dries also, uh, I was glad to hear, he said that it would be more difficult for us to focus on a great user experience that would meet the needs of a very wide group of people. Um, I was happy to hear him say that that is the harder road because I, I think it is. Uh, and eight years later, the market share um, proves this out. None is still the, the most popular CMS choice on the entire internet. That's about half the internet, no CMS whatsoever. But a full 30% of the entire internet is run by WordPress, according to w 3 Tech. Uh, Drupal down at, at 2%. And um, Drupal's growth is, is basically non-existent if you look at this, uh, this view. If you look at the view of the biggest sites on the internet, we look better. We're at, at 9%, um, according to a different set of metrics built with .com, 9% of the top 10,000 sites, compared to WordPress, still much higher, 37% of the top 1,000 sites. Um, so I, I do want to emphasize this idea of democratizing publishing, but I, I don't want to necessarily get that confused with uh, democracy itself. I think there's a strong argument to be made that as a community, Drupal is more democratic and that I think we uh, more widely distribute power amongst um, that group of core developers. Dries is more consensus oriented. He is, he is much more willing to, to let a decision making process go out much longer in the hopes of getting wide community consensus before putting his foot down and saying uh, the decision has been made and it's been made by me. But what people? What people are around to make the decision? And in Drupal, you, if you've been at, at Drupal events over the years, you've probably seen the Drupal learning curve. It's a very steep learning curve. So the people who are left around to make decisions in Drupal are the people who can climb the Drupal learning curve. And that Drupal learning curve um, gets rid of a lot of people, gets rid of, the, uh, gets rid of people who are using the software 
for publishing. WordPress has a much uh, more approachable learning curve. It means that the people who are there in the room for WordPress um, have a wider set of needs, are, are a wider set of personas that the people who are authoring content in WordPress have more sway in, in that decision. So I was really happy to hear in the Dries note this year that this is um, top of mind for Dries as well. He recognizes that uh, we need to do better addressing the needs of, uh, of that author audience. So let's, let's jump into actually looking at WordPress here. So if you were to install WordPress right now, WordPress core, you would see uh, this editor that's been there uh, since 2005. Uh, this may be your, what you remember of, of WordPress. Um, WordPress right now uh, relies on the concept of short codes for embedding more uh, rich information inside of your, your post field. And uh, speaking at least for myself, this impression of WordPress is, is why I thought, well, WordPress, and before I started at, at Pantheon and, and reintroduced myself to WordPress, I thought WordPress has difficulty addressing the complex use cases that, uh, that Drupal tackles. What we see here is a, a screenshot of advanced custom fields, basically the, the CCK of, of WordPress. Um, WordPress still has the dynamic of uh, no customizable fields in core. So like we had in, in the Drupal 6 days, there are contributed plugins that you can add for structured fields. So there are a lot of WordPress developers out there that would hope that this concept, structured fields, would be going into core. But that is, that is not what's, um, what's happening. In Drupal, we do, of course, have um, much more of a culture of relying on structured data. And, and I think this is probably our, our biggest strength. Paragraphs module in, in Drupal 8 is um, an exploding module. I just keep hearing from more and more agencies that this is one of the best things we have going on in Drupal. It allows us to work in this design component mentality. We can design perfect uh, HTML outside of Drupal, and then we can implement it with Paragraphs module. Well, I, I'm here somewhat uh, to, to say as a warning that WordPress is coming with something that's uh, that's going to be, I think, much better at achieving that concept. It's this Gutenberg editor that's coming to WordPress core. So on a certain level, it is like a really nice looking WYSIWYG. It gives you bold and italic text. You can change colors of things. And really nice detail here is when you change the color of text to something that's bad for accessibility, you get a warning saying this is a bad color choice for accessibility. It's a better fulfillment of just the idea of a what you see is what you get editor. So rather than having that short code uh, block that we just have to imagine what it's going to look like rather than trying to imagine what our Drupal paragraph might look like on the other side. We can just see the Google map that we're dealing with. This is a, a plugin that Andrew wrote for Google Maps embedding right into the WYSIWYG. Adding images is incredibly easy. One detail I want to point out here is that uh, to add the image block, I'm not pressing the button for the block. I'm just using a keyboard shortcut to say I want an image. And then I decide, no, actually, I want a gallery of images. I'm going to convert this image block to a gallery block and then just upload a bunch of images at once. I've, I've not had this easy experience of creating a, an image gallery ever in, in Drupal. I've been saying the word block a couple times here. That's the key concept in Gutenberg. Everything is a block. Each paragraph is a block. Block quote is a block. The map is a block and so on. Uh, you can have blocks inside of other blocks, nesting of blocks, uh, similar to the way you can have paragraph, uh, paragraphs in Drupal nested inside of other paragraph entities. Some blocks are static blocks, meaning a heading, a paragraph tag, a block quote. What you might imagine of that HTML is just what's directly saved into the database in WordPress. Some blocks are dynamic. Basically, I, I'm saying here I want a, a block of recent posts. Rather than the default five, I want specifically six recent posts, and I want it displayed in two columns instead of one. So what's getting saved into the database is recent posts, six of them, and two columns. What we see in the editor here is a React block, like React is used for the editor itself. React is talking to the WordPress REST API in order to give us this rendering inside the editor. But when it gets rendered out to the general public, it's server-side processing of just that idea of recent posts, six of them, two columns, that's getting processed server-side. You can have reusable blocks. Uh, basically, I, I have a block quote about blocks that I'm designating to be a reusable block. I can then embed that in other posts, update it in one place, and it'll update everywhere. You can lock down post types, basically the WordPress equivalent of content types. I'm 
my first reaction to this was, wait, whoa, 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 too much flexibility. I need to lock things down. Well, of course you can lock things down for the post type, so it makes sense to lock things down. The data model is, is almost, going to, almost certainly going to be the most controversial choice uh, as far as a Drupal audience is concerned. The data model is the body field. WordPress treasures the body field. It considers that you know, nearly sacred in its importance. So what we see here is that each block ends up getting saved as basically the HTML that, that is the rendered representation of the block. That gets delineated by HTML comments. The HTML comments say what the block type is. There may be some JSON within the HTML comment. And uh, the reason they're doing this is because they think this makes the, uh, the body field more comprehensible more migratable, more ownable. It's a better fulfillment of the idea of democratizing publishing. Uh, there could be technical advantages to you know, storing each block as its own database record. Um, and they've written, the, they've written the editor in such a way that the serialization, the saving, could be swappable. So you could just store this as JSON. You could just store this as uh, its own records in, in the database block by block. But for democratizing publishing, they want the default to just be the whole bit of HTML. All right, with that, I'm going to turn things over to Andrew to talk more about how exactly do they get here from, from a technical perspective. Yeah, thanks, Steve. So this uh, has been a long time coming in WordPress, so I kind of wanted to share with you the journey of JavaScript adoption. This isn't something that uh, happened overnight. This, this happened over a long period of time. And so as Drupal looks to uh, adopt JavaScript more into WordPress core, and we hear about JavaScript-powered administrative screens and things like that, I just want to share this journey so we can maybe uh, learn from it and, and take some messages away. So. WordPress actually has a different feature besides the Gutenberg editor called the customizer, where basically you have configuration over on the left in that pane, and on the right you get a live preview. This is a fully JavaScript-driven application where users can go in, update the settings, see that live preview on the right. You can drag and drop things. Uh, you can do all of this really cool stuff. And it first came into core back in 2012 in WordPress 3.4. So it's been there quite a long time. Uh, core uses it a fair bit. End users like that they can go in and update their logo and things like this and see the preview without having to publish and then go look at the front end of their site. Uh, gets rid of that save and surprise. But developer adoption was not very high with the customizer. So in 2015, they made it required that any theme uploaded to the official repository had to use theme settings uh, within the customizer rather than their own settings page. And developers did that, but they just sort of did only that. That was the bare minimum. That's all they did, even though they had this great JavaScript JavaScript application that was extensible and they could do all kinds of really neat things with it. Um, here we can see things, you could like lazy load items. So if I wanted to build a slider on the home page, I could have a button so clients could dynamically add slides and upload images and see how it's going to look before they publish. But nobody really did that outside of a few enterprise projects where clients would foot the bill for that custom development. There weren't a lot of contrib modules things going on in the community taking advantage of this. Um, and then in late 2015, Automatic, the company sort of behind WordPress.com, which is a commercial product, built Calypso, which was a React native alternative interface for the WordPress administrative experience. Um, it ran Mac, Windows, Linux. You could fire it up. You could connect your sites to it. You could publish all your content in it in this nice sort of native app way. And it's, you see here, much different um, looking than kind of the editor we've been seeing previously. And so people thought, whoa, this is you know, going to be a complete game changer. Maybe this will come into uh, WordPress core and things like that. But no, no adoption. Um, some folks that use the dot-com commercial product used it. A few other sites, you had to install Jetpack, which is also done by Automatic, kind of large company in the space. You had to connect to their APIs to use this product, and people didn't really adopt it. Uh, so WordPress has been trying to get JavaScript into core with these experiences for quite some time. Um, and after Calypso, still in 2015, the state of the word, which is similar to the Dries note, happens at WordCamp US in December every year. Uh, Matt Mullenweg, 
uh, sort of the, the leader of WordPress, just gave a homework assignment, learn JavaScript deeply. And people are like, OK. Um, JavaScript is, you know, kind of surging and taking over the web in a lot of spaces. And people are like, well, what do I learn? What's going on? And so they had this uh, kind of directive, but didn't really know what to do with it. Um, and then in December 2016, he said he's putting back the product lead hat, uh, putting the product lead hat back on. As Steve talked about, WordPress went from a release cycle every four months to Matt kind of said, hey, I'm taking over. We're not going to do releases anymore. Uh, it's just going to be done when it's done. Um, so this was 2016. And the only idea we had of the new editor was this one slide at the keynote that said it will be block-based and it will replace widgets and short codes and all the other things we have going on. It's, just a, it's gonna be this cool new thing that will uh, take care of all of it. And people kind of went, what? <laughs> What's going on, right? We're supposed to learn JavaScript very deeply. Uh, this thing is coming to core, but now the community doesn't have as much control. We don't have input. We're not having a community release lead. Um, the head of Automatic is taking back over, and we don't know what's coming or when. Pretty scary stuff, right? And so even though there was this homework assignment to learn JavaScript deeply, we had React and Babel and ES6 and Webpack and all these things come out, and people were kind of learning it, but not for WordPress. People who were doing WordPress development were slow to adopt this. There are a couple uh, people that had third-party um, plugins and things that maybe they would rewrite their plugin admin screen in Vue or React or something because it was cool and they wanted to play with it, but overall the wide adoption was not there. And so there was this big question mark around JavaScript and WordPress. We knew something was coming. Uh, we knew this editor was coming, but people didn't know what they had to do, uh, when, when things are going to be released and all of that stuff. So um, there was a, a little bit of this bumpy road. Um, WordPress actually threw around its weight a bit against Facebook, and they wanted to use React to drive these JavaScript experiences, but it was not licensed to be open source friendly. And finally, Facebook kind of blinked first, and they relicensed React uh, with the MIT license so that it is open source compatible. Uh, and they started publishing documentation. So this is uh, in, in examples of what this is going to look like. So this is a screenshot. Here we have some documentation on the development stuff going under the hood. But it was really a big chunk of developers from Automatic uh, with Matt leading this charge and doing a lot of this development. And it was on GitHub, but it still didn't have a lot of involvement and people couldn't quite see what was going on. And so. As we move further down the road, they release some tools. WordPress has a command line uh, called WPCLI, similar to Drush. So you could scaffold um, a plugin and create your own custom block. And uh, that worked well for developers, but it still didn't reach that wider audience. And so there's still this kind of, you know, what's going on here? And then at State of the Word uh, in December just last year, you can kind of see the quote here, they did a live demo uh, where the technical lead for the Gutenberg project got on stage and actually said in the mic, I just pulled a bunch of in-progress branches together. I hope this works. Can you imagine that at a Dries note? Um, and so came in, gave this like really solid 15 minute live demo, live streamed in front of the whole audience, uh, everything that showed it off. And people saw kind of the power of what Steve was showing, this new content authoring experience, and they got really excited. Um, it was announced that WordPress was going to continue this focus, that there's still no set release, you still need to learn JavaScript deeply, and Gutenberg is here to stay. It was this very loud message, and people finally said, okay, we're going to pay attention now. That live demo was sort of the turning point when the community kind of went, I don't know what's going on. It was very, very clear after this uh, state of the word presentation what was going on and that you need to adopt Gutenberg because uh, this is coming. And so the community reacted and they got behind it. I think they reacted in a very positive way because of that live demo and getting them involved earlier in the process. Gutenberg is not released yet. 
If they had waited until this thing was merged into Core and then got on stage and showed off a polished video of the final thing, it would sort of be too late for adoption. They needed the community to help support this effort in order for an initiative this large to be successful. Uh, and so we see this is a, a, the advanced custom field Steve was talking about that a lot of folks use for those data structures. And they came in after this uh, state of the word at the end here at December 2017, published a blog, blog post that their focus in 2018 is full compatibility. And they're focusing their de development time on that. The community started creating blog posts and articles. We looked at that uh, map short code. Here was a blog post that you took the short code with the square brackets, you put in a GitHub gist URL, and then it popped out on the other side. This was a step-by-step -step development tutorial of how to convert that to a block um, and, and really get getting people excited and learning about this. Uh, there's been webinars and all sorts of things. We've been hosting some at Pantheon. There's been a lot around the community as well. As Create Guten Block, this is probably my favorite. We looked at earlier WPCLI, kind of the Drush equivalent, letting you spin up a way to develop your own uh, block, but it was vanilla JavaScript. This actually takes create React app and extends it so that you can create your own custom block and write uh, React code with JSX and all the modern tools that you want to be using. And you can spin that up in one command, lowering that barrier to entry so that people really can uh, get their hands on this and start adopting the technology now before it's actually merged into core. And I went to WordCamp Miami uh, just last month in March. And so we went and there were actually two tracks, two full tracks at this conference. This is one of the larger camps in the WordPress space, has over a thousand attendees. And we saw uh, one track an entire day devoted to Gutenberg development, how to get started with your first block, um, how to take a look at those things. And a completely another track that was just about React and ES6 and modern JavaScript. And remember, this is a community who has largely been writing PHP um, for the most part. There's been some jQuery and parts of WordPress have backbone, but really to have this huge shift from majorly writing PHP to JavaScript, it, it's a really big initiative. So this community support is imperative. And so now at the end of all this, we're at a state now where Gutenberg is being uh, still continuing development. And there's some things that need to be worked out, like accessibility in the editor. We saw that preview of giving you a warning about accessibility on the front end. Well, how does a JavaScript application be accessible for people using it, working on mobile, these sorts of things. But with the community behind it and this very large support of automatic and sort of this being the sole focus, uh, we're at a point where I think it can be very successful and it's going to you know, be released when it's ready, hopefully be done right, but having everybody behind it at this stage when we're still uh, in the beta phase is very, very important. And now WordPress is embracing this rather than people being apprehensive and scared when this thing comes into core and they're already having conversations with clients about, hey, I'm doing a new site build for you. This new editor experience is coming. Let me develop, for in the, uh, develop your site with that experience now, and we'll go back, and there might be a few small bumps, but for the most part, things are, are fairly stable. APIs aren't going to change largely. They can go in and build that and tackle those projects now so that they're not launching something uh, that in the next year is going to be obsolete. So with that, I'm going to pass it back off to Steve um, to uh, have some conversation yeah. starters. Yeah, so this, of course, is the core conversation track. So uh, I'm, hope, I'm hopeful that there are conversations in the room. If there are, please uh, come up to the front. Some possible conversation starters. Everything is a block is what we hear on the Gutenberg side of things. And that sounds really familiar to me uh, on the Drupal side of things. There's, there's been a mentality that in, in Drupal 8, the block system is much better. So we could just do Drupal site building where we just think everything is a block and maybe that would make some things better. But is, is that a good way of thinking? Um, do we want other, uh, do we want our site building tools to evolve into content editing tools? I think that's what's basically happening with some of the uh, layout based modules that are coming into Drupal core right now. They're essentially um, site building config based modules that are uh, just from conversations I've had with agencies are about to become content editing 
tools. Agencies are planning on taking the layout builder and giving it to clients as a content editing tool. That concerns me a little bit because I think uh, you could have more success going the direction WordPress is going with uh, basically taking a tool that is first and foremost a content editing tool, turning it into a site building tool. Um, how can we get community uh, to embrace modern JavaScript? There's been plenty of conversation uh, around that. Um, one of my biggest questions uh, as, as Drupal looks at that question is what is really going to be possible that's not currently possible? I, I think we could, we could struggle if we simply rewrite everything in JavaScript and end up with the same end functionality, just happens to be rewritten in JavaScript. Uh, and is there, is there room for us to reimagine the editing experience? But uh, I'm first curious to hear, are there any other questions in the room? So yeah, if you have something, please come up to the mic, um, or if you want to shout, we can repeat it for the recording, but the microphone is much, much easier. All right, we got one. <laughs> <laughs> Just one quick question. Do you know if there was this uh, some kind of um, user experience uh, testing before implementing all this? Because you said that it goes, it happened, everything house in automatic, or? Yeah, so they actually, um, at WordCamp US in December, um, and even at Miami, the one I was just at in March, they had Gutenberg booths set up where they would ask people from the community who maybe haven't even heard of it, just showed up to their local camp to get on, use the editor, and they recorded the experience and then started asking them questions afterwards. Um, so there is, paired with the technical lead um, for this project, there's also a design lead and they're doing things like user testing and studies and all these, and trying to get the interface right so they're not just going technical first. There's really this design focus, user testing, and then once the design spec is updated, then we can go in and technically implement it. And I'll just add on, one of the, one of the reasons that works is because WordCamp US has attendees who are content editors. Uh, if I would love to say, yes, Drupal should do that. We should have a booth where you can uh, do a live uh, user experience test of any new experimental module. Well, okay, if, if we do that, most of the people walking up will be developers uh, who think about such tools in very different ways. So I, I'm glad we're you know, making an active effort to diversify the, the group of people that comes to DrupalCon. What's been the approach to migration of old sites? Uh, you can probably take this one better. Yeah, so uh, a lot of agencies I've been talking to haven't been migrating sites yet because this is not in core, it's still in beta, it's, it hasn't been merged, so that is still to be seen. Uh, but like I said, a lot of them are starting new projects now with Gutenberg so that they have that experience and they're learning it. Um, they're using the tool now, they're getting familiar with it, and they're starting to have those conversations with clients and do some of that discovery and scoping so that it, when it does come into core, they're prepared and they're ready. And so that's why that community buy-in is really important, that if it just merged into core and people hadn't done all of that work ahead of time, then there's a lot of pain there. Um, and so it's important that they're involved in the process early and can kind of wrap their head around it before the actual um, shift takes place. And WordPress is kind of always had backwards compatibility and this is going to be the biggest thing that will break uh, a lot of sites that WordPress has ever had. I've seen people that have been on WordPress versions, you know, higher versions of like 2.5, 2.6 and they can upgrade all the way to the current version of 4.9.5, which is pretty incredible. Um, and so this is going to be a much bigger leap. I'd imagine there's uh, one thing that's been very controversial with Gutenberg is that it is going to be opt out, not opt in. So if you update to WordPress 5.0 when it releases, you will have the uh, Gutenberg editor from the start. All of your existing content will not be transformed in, into Gutenberg. If you go to edit it, there's a convert to block button and the, the plugin will, uh, the editor will make its best effort to convert those, but there might be some cleanup there. So it will be kind of a labor intensive process, but I imagine that sites will sort of have this mix and there will be some that will opt out. There will be an additional plugin you can install and say, no, I want to revert to the classic version, but eventually that will sunset and people understand it's been very clear that this is coming and they need to get ahead of it. And, and another perspective there is, uh, how do you migrate out of it? Uh, the, the, the reason, one of the reasons they're storing uh, the data in that body field 
is because they want the people who own the sites to feel like they own the content. And if you can look at the body field and see, oh, this is just my HTML, then you can imagine migrating it to Drupal or Joomla or just about any other system because the body field is totally comprehensible. Uh, I think about that compared to panelizer heavy implementations I did in Drupal 7. And at the time thinking about these are content editors who are making content choices that are getting stored in serialized arrays or objects that are getting stored in the database. I don't think there's really a migration path out of this. Uh, I think if I were you know, later contracted to migrate them out of that site, I might be better off just parsing the HTML that gets rendered um, rather than attempting to parse through the, you know, the panelizer um, arrays and objects that are getting stored in the database. Um, and and I, I just, I really respect the, the level of thought that um, the WordPress developers have brought to this. I would really strongly recommend reading the blog posts and the documentation that is in the repo is incredibly thoughtful. Um, I think that's, that's another lesson the Drupal community, uh, community could take, just incredible uh, in repo um, documentation and, and defense of their choices. Uh, is there any other major features that uh, are coming with WordPress 5 that are worth noting? Like any changes to the way they handle taxonomy, anything that is it purely just content editing? I think content editing is, is the big this one and that, a, like that's, that's, uh, been, that's been controversial because I, I think it's like, I think mul the, like the people who care about multi-site yeah. are angry yeah. <laughs> that none of their patches are getting committed um, because the focus is all on this. And there might be a, a minor release at some point. So maybe a WordPress, you know, we're at 4.9.5 right now. There might be another like WordPress 4.9.6 or 0.7 that have these minor patches and tweaks, but nothing major wow. um, is going to go in until 5.0 comes out. So, so is it the case then that that comparison you're making earlier, is it pretty much like a, the, the, the Drupal paragraph is kind of equivalent to the Gutenberg block? Is that what, what I'm hearing? I think so. Uh, I, my first thought was, um, you know, it's a body field. It's a WYSIWYG for the body field. Someone's probably going to port this to the Drupal body field, and someone still might. Um, but I, I would not. I would not recommend it because the Drupal community so values our structured data in our fields, and I, I don't think Drupal developers would give that up. Um, one perspective I've heard on Gutenberg is that. It is a net increase in data structure compared to traditional WordPress core. So yes, that blobby body field might look um, ugly to a Drupal eye, but it is, a, it is a net increase in structure on the level of WordPress core alone. So I don't think Drupal as a community would, would tolerate a net decrease in data structure. So, so, so while you could put Gutenberg onto a Drupal body field, I, I don't think, I don't think anyone would do that beyond, you know, like the exercise of it. But I think there, you, know, you could be more um, productive, I think, by taking that and putting it on top of paragraphs or putting it on top of one, or more, one of our more structured data stores. And so one, and one last question was, how, how is the content portability handled with the block? Like, are you, can you put like HTML into, into the Gutenberg block? And how do you separate the, the theming layout? I, I, I missed that part. Yeah, so you can, uh, there is, and it, it depends on privileges as well. WordPress core currently only administrators can put certain things in. So like if I want to embed certain items or, or put JavaScript right in the body field, that's locked down with privileges. So Gutenberg's kind of going to be similar. Um, all the blocks, you can view the, the rendered view, but you can also view the HTML underneath. You can edit, edit it directly. So you could put in just, uh, they have kind of the existing editor is actually basically a block and you could put HTML in there. Um, if you wanted to. Uh, and on for the theming side, uh, basically you can go in and you want a separation between the presentation layer um, and sort of the structure. So there will be like I have the Google Maps block and on the front end it renders a div, Google Map, whatever, and then it would be up to a theme to come in and say, all right, I'm going to style this gallery. I'm going to style this block quote, doing that with CSS and then the HTML uh, that's coming out of Gutenberg and the things that in core are, are going to be there and you just need to theme around them. I have a comment about the everything is a block thing, but I think there's maybe a question that could help with that a little bit too. So in, sure. uh, in the WordPress Gutenberg, 
Uh, could you elaborate on how you manage reusable blocks? Sure. Uh, so if you designate a block as reusable, it becomes a record in the posts table. So the posts table contains every blog post, every page. Um, separate post types don't get made into separate tables uh, the way they do in, kind of do in, in Drupal. Um, that they're all just stacked up in the one table. Um, so there's a post type column and there's a post type, I think it is just like WP block or block. Uh, that's how you know this is like just a block and it can be reusable. So at the level of the data store, when you use a reusable block, what gets saved into that body field is just like a reference to post ID one, two, three, and that post is a reusable block. And if you pick a reusable block in the editor, you get like an auto suggest list or how do you? Yeah, uh, I, I think it just, it just starts like, you go to the next post that you're writing and it'll just be there in the list of all blocks, I think, that's what I remember. Yeah, yeah and uh, I haven't done a ton with reusable blocks lately, but um, being able to name them and things like that, so you know, my favorite yeah. quote or George Washington quote or whatever, right? And then when you're going- <laughs> The two most popular block types. Yeah, right and they have, a, <laughs> they have like, you can search, so when you insert a new block, you get a list of all of them, they're kind of categorized and stuff, but I expect there will be like dozens or hundreds, right? And tons of these as people add yeah. uh, extensions and things. So um, you can search as well. So I created the Google map one. If you go in and type map or Google, you can have these keywords that will filter down uh, and help you find what you're looking for. They also have kind of suggested blocks. So if you're somebody who's inserting galleries all the time, well, when you click that button to insert new ones, it's gonna put gallery kind of at the top for you, that That's sort nice. of stuff, so. Cool, yeah, the, the comment related to all that about you know everything being a block. I mean, conceptually, uh, I like that. That works well for me, building with components. That, that's nice. But the thing that I often think of and have been thinking about a little bit this week um, is how you manage those blocks. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think for WordPress, I mean, we, we talked a little bit how you do that now. And uh, some of that is just punted because it's all in the body field, which ooh, I don't know about that. But um, on the Drupal side, like if those are literally uh, blocks in Drupal, which is, I think, what Layout Builder does think of them as. They could mm -hmm. still yeah. be paragraphs inside of that block, but um, I think we have a gap in how you manage those blocks and how you can get at them and how you can create them. Mm -hmm. um, so I see that as a bit of a problem, but there are things that you know we're trying to do and issues to try to resolve that, but I think it's important. Great. Comment over. Thanks. Thanks. Hi. Hi. Uh, I work in the marketing department, and mm -hmm. we are right now debating, uh, do we stick with Drupal or move to WordPress? Mm -hmm. And things like this are, are top of mind. Uh, they, they see these, these features and say, like, we want that. So I, I'm, I've been looking at, like, should Drupal reimagine the editing experience in a big way? I've had a lot of conversations about that here and on Twitter, uh, like this past week with people. Um, and I'm wondering, like, you know, the, the website as a service industry is eating away at, at this kind of stuff. So you've got Wix and Squarespace and all this kind of stuff. Site owners see features on products like that and say, I want it, which is, you know, what, what my bosses are doing. Um, I wonder if, if Drupal doesn't reimagine the content editing experience that it's seeding market share and becomes a niche product for a niche market of glacially moving government agencies and institutions. Only things of extreme scale and, you know, ambitious digital experiences. Um, and that seeds community, which may see, you know, uh, like may end up leading to, to lower time and development, fewer features, things like that. And even those large institutions are eventually going to catch up and say, like, we want these kind of features that we're seeing out there, like these, these easy to use content editors. I would, I would ask, moreover, you know, rather than it should, like, does Drupal have the will and, and the want to, to even engage in something like that? Uh, I hope so, <laughs> and and that's you know that's not a question any one person can answer definitively. Um, I, I I find ambitious digital experiences to be in, inspiring in a certain way, uh, but I think about something like being able to easily upload multiple images to an image gallery. Dries used that same example in his own um, in his own Dries node this week that Facebook makes it really easy to upload a bunch of images at once and start captioning them. I, I honestly don't think that that's amb ambitious. Like, that was, a, that was a feature I needed when I got into web development over a decade ago, the ability to make an image gallery, and I didn't want to upload each one at once. Um, so 
I, I, I also am, am concerned that Drupal will um, will fade in its relevance if we're not able to to meet some core features of, of expectations. Yeah, and this is, you know, being at Pantheon, we have a unique perspective working with agencies that do both um, and, and serving Drupal and WordPress. And so uh, it's sort of a warning, right? We kind of want to do some education because if you're working with Drupal and you're going in to pitch somebody who's a marketer or who's that end user, right? Ultimately, that's the type of person that's making the decision. It's not the IT folks or the developers who are making this, the, the decision, right? That's where's the money in those things. They might, they might be able to help convince that person to go one way or the other. Uh, but if you come in and you pitch um, just a bunch of fields versus an editor you know, experience like this, the more modern thing that people want to see that Wix Squarespace kind of stuff, I kind of have a gut feeling of which one's going to win that pitch, you know. Yeah, like I'm, I'm someone with 10 years working in Drupal, working in a marketing department that's now saying WordPress. So my job is, is probably at risk here. Like I can retrain as fast as I possibly can, but I, I get a feeling that the, the speed of business is going to move faster than I can catch up. Yeah, and, and uh, uh, I think to somewhat parrot what Andrew is saying, uh, Pantheon's perspective is that uh, Websites are, are, are purposeful most of the time, especially when, when, there, when there's someone paid to be a marketer for the website. There's an expectation that that website is serving some kind of business need, and those business needs don't particularly care if, if they get implemented in, in Drupal or WordPress. Yeah, yeah, thank you. Hey, how you guys doing? Hi. So the thing I was wondering about was, since it's so open-ended, how do you prevent an open-ended editor like that from making there be millions of variations that you need to code for and test? Like, is there, are there ways to restrict it at some, some, some level? Like this body field, mm -hmm. hey, you can use yeah. these for or, or however, things like that. Yeah, so we showed that a little bit with the templating. You can lock down and you can actually have sort of placeholder blocks. So a title should go here, an image should go here, and you can make those flexible so people can rearrange them. You can lock it down so they can only use uh, those blocks and they must fill in these things, right? Um, you could do it by content type um, and you can actually whitelist and blacklist uh, blocks as well. So there's um, WordPress has hooks and you can go in and by default, all of the core blocks are there, but you can say if I'm on this content type, only make these blocks available, um, those sorts of things. And if you're really diving in the admin experience, I expect that one of the things this is most disruptive to is WordPress has lots of page builder type things where we saw those short codes and stuff and Steve was talking about content not being portable. They'll yeah. have like short codes inside of short codes in the body field to do this page buildery thing. Yeah. Gutenberg's gonna disrupt that a lot, but I can see them extending on top of it um, where maybe out of the box you can't have all the lockdown permission type things you want without some custom development and then some you know, page builder type extensions on top of that, giving you that more granular control without having to dig into the code. Gotcha, and, and then one follow-up question is like, do you think something like Gutenberg is gonna slow down any adoption for actual structured fields? Like I can, like I can see the, the greatness of something like that, and we do it a lot with, hey, it's an open-ended page. It's more, more of a marketing-driven page as opposed to a faculty member page or a, a news item or things like that, which, WordPress core by itself really can't do that very well. Like, mm -hmm. how, what does the future look like? With uh, that? I think that's definitely gonna happen. Uh, I, I went to the Decoupled Summit on, on Monday morning and I saw a presentation from Jeff Eaton that, that gave me um, just two new thoughts that, that I think are, are related here. One, he talked about the Gartner hype cycle that pretty much all technology goes through where people get excited about a technology and it's coming soon and it's gonna be great and then you start using it and you realize, oh, it doesn't do everything quite the way it promised and you hit the trough of disillusionment. And then you figure out, oh wait, but maybe we can make it do that and it, it starts getting better and then you hit the plateau of productivity. So I think, uh, I think Gutenberg right now is near the top, what I hope is the top <laughs> of, of the hype because it's not being used by a huge number of sites yet. Right. So it demos great, some impressive GIFs, I think, but yep. there aren't, I, I think you're, you're um, describing one of the problems that a lot of real sites are gonna face of they can get something done really, really quickly. 
but maybe they would have been better off with structured fields because um, you know maybe after six months you w you don't want the the team bio picture to be above Here on the, your stage, title on the stage right over there. <laughs> right but the way it got stored was in that order yes it was locked down when you edited it for the first time but then it got stored in that order right and maybe all you intended was to have the the, the structure of person's name, job title, image, and body field. But because of the Gutenberg data storage model, what you got was those things, but in that particular order, even if you didn't want to impose that order, had you, you know, save them as separate fields, then you could very easily rearrange them in a template. That's like, that's what we've been doing in Drupal for a dozen years, and it's, it's wonderful. Uh, so yes, that is, is gonna happen. And Eaton talked about um, the need for using content tools to designate meaning. So I, I think yeah. another example will be people will mean highlighted, but they'll select the option for green or blue because that's what's there. Right. So it'll get saved into their content as green or blue, and then they'll, they'll do a redesign and they want highlighted to mean, to, to be represented as yellow, but it's stored in their data as green or blue. That's a good point. And I it's, think you know. About them, somebody going to Gutenberg and then redesigning soon. Right. How does that transition? What do they do? Right. Oh, that's so, so I think that'll be some of the things in in the trough of disillusionment. Gotcha. Thank you so much, guys. Yeah. Um, a couple of things. Uh, just recently, you mentioned something about content type. So, are they going to introduce content types uh, other than post and page? Uh, so, WordPress already has more than post and page. Post and page are what come out of the box, like Drupal has page and article, but you can create custom ones. That's been in WordPress for many, many years. It's one of the reasons uh, agency I was working with at the time actually adopted WordPress, because now we could create types for, you know, team bio pages or testimonials or whatever we wanted to do. Through custom coding, though but not like through the UI, like uh, content types. Of yeah, UI. it's through custom coding. There are um, plugins that you can add that give you a UI for it, but out of the box, uh, you, you do have to code for it. And um, I've used uh, in WordPress, uh, like a, I think it was called Composer, where it has the blocks, and you can add a header, and you can add, is that kind of like along the same lines? Like, because I know if I'm using Composer and I say, I want a three column wide and a text box here and an image on the side. I can choose the different blocks and then I can put them wherever I want. I can drag and drop. But then if I look at the end, I don't have the blocks anymore. I have one long page of HTML that has the, um, the code for the different you blocks. You can do exactly that in Gutenberg right now. Um, and I think we kind of saw a quick preview at the beginning of the presentation of the other JavaScript application in WordPress, the customizer, where you update configuration. Um, so this right now, Gutenberg is just in the body field. Uh, I'd imagine after it gets merged in, there will be a next phase where a, you know, the body field could be a block with other blocks in it, but then the header in a footer can be a block that people can add into, and it will sort of merge with the already customization and live preview experience in WordPress to kind of be the full page editor and Steve was talking about they're going with a content first approach but I eventually see it expanding to the entire site. Um, so I just wanted to clarify something that I saw earlier is is the ultimate plan to have widgets go completely away? No more widgets in the admin menu? So I don't know the answer to that but um, right now a lot of the widgets like latest posts and those sorts of things are blocks and so the aim of Gutenberg is to replace widgets and short codes and all of these different ways that WordPress enters content into one unified fashion. Mm -hmm. um, I'd imagine for backwards compatibility legacy reasons they'll stick around um, especially for sites that already have them right um, so if you have a there's this concept in WordPress where you can like have a sidebar or a certain area and you can put these widgets in it. Um, so you might have a site that has like latest posts over here as a widget and then the map is the short code kind of square bracket thing. All of that is eventually going to be become blocks, but when they'll phase out the other stuff, I don't know. So then related to that, um, a big thing that we use widgets for is global content, you know, um, placing a menu someplace or, you know, placing nav. Um, is there a global content option for, I know you can share, but is there a global way to automatically include it without specifically having to add it to each page? 
Uh, that's something you could probably template and, and theme if you really wanted to, but I think we're still in that first phase of it's editor only right now. So oh, it remains to be seen as Gutenberg gets merged into core, finalized in the editor, and s expands to other areas how that's going to play out. But mm -hmm. right now, the focus is just on the editor. So while those are things that we can imagine happening, there really hasn't been a lot of discussion about how that will happen uh, because we're really uh, the conversation is really focused on what's going on right now. Because I could see a really like amazing um, application for that would be menu building, because like menu nav walkers are like huge pain yeah. in WordPress, and having some sort of a drag and drop solution would just be amazing for so many people. Yeah, and that's the type so, of, you know, when I said page builders will probably extend on top, I could imagine as Gutenberg expands outside of the editor that there will be uh, additional plugins and extensions that give you all sorts of, of things based on top of it, but mm -hmm. that still would, would be way down the road. We don't even know when we're getting the editor piece, so getting it for the entire site is uh, pretty ambitious. Uh, j just to add on there, I think one of the reasons the WordPress community is nervous is because there is this dynamic of paid page builder plugins. Um, uh, I mentioned how like the islands of WordPress and Drupal have very similar fundamentals, but small differences end up turning into big differences. One of those perhaps seemingly small differences is a tolerance for paid plugins. Like Drupal culturally rejects the idea of paid modules or, or has historically. WordPress doesn't, and I, I can't give you a full explanation of why, but they have paid plugins. So imagine if um, if the panels ecosystem and, and the display suite ecosystem had direct you know, monetary um, motivation to stay separate because their company is built on each and they're charging for panels and charging for display suite. Basically what I'm saying is WordPress has multiple page builder ecosystems that companies are built around because people are paying you know, $50, $100, whatever it is to buy this plugin uh, and they are very entrenched and I think rightly nervous about what exactly is Gutenberg going to mean for them and, and we don't exactly know yet. Yeah, uh, and just to add on to that, I think that's one of the reasons why Gutenberg is being a focus is there's that kind of Wix Squarespace editing experience that people expect and there were third parties that were trying to provide it on top of WordPress, but it was very fractured. You might have to pay for this or install that, and every experience is different, and so bringing that into core is really gonna be the only way to bring the entire CMS up to those expectations that users have nowadays. All right, well, we have two minutes left. If anyone has a burning question, please come up. Uh, otherwise, I think we, uh, we can end it here. And everyone, enjoy the closing ceremonies. Thank you so much. Yeah. I haven't. Yeah, it's, it's one of the, the page builders, yeah. yeah. Uh, I thought it was a visual.
hand is like. Let me see if we can find some space for the initiatives. Yeah, I mean, it wasn't ideal. Like, they weren't recorded, but it was there. I took notes. Right, but the implementation is 